Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, July 30th, 2017. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, Christian Education. If you have your Bibles, we're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2.15, we are talking today as we continue our study on our Baptist faith and message. If you have a bulletin and you're following along with us, today we are talking about Christian education. Christian education. Let me give you the outline. The outline is, number one, we teach the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. Number two, we teach the preeminence of Christ. The preeminence of Christ. Let me give you the short definition. Jesus is the one and only. There's nobody greater, there's nobody better than Jesus. Number three, we teach the importance of wisdom. So those three, authority, preeminence, and importance. Let me read to you straight out of the Baptist faith and message as my introduction. Christian education. Christianity is the faith of enlightenment and intelligence. In Jesus Christ abide all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All sound learning is, therefore, a part of our Christian heritage. The new birth opens all faculties and creates a thirst for knowledge. Moreover, the cause of education in the kingdom of Christ is coordinated with the causes of missions, general benevolence, and should... Uh, receive along with these liberal support from the churches. An adequate system of Christian education is necessary to complete spiritual, uh, yeah, spiritual program of growth for Christ's people. There's two things I want to remind you. I still like the word Sunday school. Sunday school, why? What do you go to school for? You go to school to learn. And our Sunday school hour is a learning time in the Word of God. I still think it's the best Christian education a lay person can get. The second thing is the Word of God. What is it? It's our textbook. Okay? It's our textbook. It is where we learn. It is where we learn. And these two things are very important in Christian education. Now, let's start with our first point. Number one, Christian education. We teach the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. Look at 2 Timothy. Just one verse as we launch out into this message. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm reading from the New King James, but this is one case where I like the Old King James better. The Old King James says, Study. Study to show yourself approved a worker unto God, who a a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What's the word of truth? Folks, it's the Bible. It's the Bible. It's our textbook. It is the absolute authority in our Christian walk. I don't want to know man's opinion. All right? Everyone has an opinion. But it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is what the Word of God teaches. And that's what we are talking about, the authority of Scripture. Turn with me to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. And Peter wrote uh, 2 Peter uh, to talk about false teachers. And folks, there are false teachers in the world. Just because somebody, anybody can buy airtime. Anybody can put a suit on. Anybody can have a Bible in their hand. But you need to know that what they are saying lines up with the Word of God. That is so important. And folks, I can listen to somebody five minutes or less and tell you whether I need to be listening to that person or not. All right? Number one, does it line up with the Word of God? Number two, is my spirit bearing witness with that spirit? Number three, is this person's life, uh, is, is, are they an example of what Jesus Christ 
is. And those are important things to remember. Look at verse 16. For we did not follow cunning, devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesties. What is, what is Peter talking about? He's talking about people and fables. They just make stuff up. Fables are made up stories. Fables are opinions. And I'm telling you what people are doing now, folks. They are changing the word of God to line up with their lives. And we need to change our lives to line up with the word of God. And I'm telling you, you can't believe everyone that just speaks. All right? Some people are making up religions and making up things. Fables, he says. Now look what it says. When you made known the power in coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What is Peter saying? Peter is saying, let me tell you something. I was there. Okay? I was an eyewitness to what Jesus did. The close three was Peter, James, and John. And they were with him all the time. These guys prayed with them. These guys ate with Jesus. These guys saw the miracles that Jesus did. They saw the glory of God. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm, not, I'm telling you as an eyewitness, there's two keys to be an eyewitness. You need to see something. You, you see something as an eyewitness and you hear something also. And that's what Peter is testifying to. He's saying, let me tell you something. I saw Jesus Christ. I heard from God himself and were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verse 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. Notice those are capitalized. Capitalized means deity. He's saying we heard the voice of God. Now folks, I've been, I've been living 59 years. I've been in the ministry 37 years and I have never heard the voice of God. God has never said, now, I wish every once in a while he would say, hey, knucklehead, would you listen to me? I wish he would. Now, folks, I know when God's speaking to me. The Holy Spirit tells me. But Peter is saying, listen, we saw Jesus firsthand, firsthand personal experience. We heard the voice of God. Now, folks, that's an amazing testimony. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we know he's talking about the baptism of Jesus in Matthew chapter 23. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What is he talking about? Peter's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. We don't have time to stop there and go because of the message. But it is an amazing story. You look in Matthew chapter 17 and you read that sometime today and you will see the glory of God. Jesus glowing. Jesus Christ Himself. Verse 17. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed. What's the prophetic word? Folks, we're talking about the Old Testament. All right, we're talking about Moses and he gave us the law. We are talking about Elijah and the prophets in the Old Testaments. We have the written word for us. See, at this time, the word had not been written. In the Old Testament, they had to believe in a coming Messiah. You talk about people in, of amazing faith, but we have a copy of the word of God from the prophets, from the apostles. And folks, we have such an advantage. It's our textbook. It's who we are. It's what we believe. It's everything to a growing Christian. We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Listen to me, folks. We live in a dark world. People are not obeying the word of God. People are not obeying the Ten Commandments. People are not loving their brothers and sisters like they should. They are deceived. They are listening to fables. They are listening to opinions. And we have such an advantage as Christians to have a written word of God. Now look at this. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. What is he talking about, folks? The morning star is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. He is everything to a Christian. His life, His virgin birth, 
There are people that say, oh, how can it be a virgin birth? Folks, you have to believe it by faith. It is written in the Word of God. His perfect life. I've talked to many of people that says, there's no way he lived here 33 years and was perfect. Folks, that's what the Word of God teaches it, and I believe it with all my heart. And even his death, his death gave life. His death, he didn't stay dead. He resurrected the, on the third day. And I'm telling you, he is at the right hand of God today, even as we speak. The Word of God confirms all of this in Jesus' life. Now look at this, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Oh, listen to me, folks. We must understand the Word of God is literal. The Word of God is holy. The Word of God teaches us. The Word of God guides us. We don't want man's opinion. We want to know what the Word of God says. Thus saith the Lord. And opinions will get you in trouble. It'll get you in trouble. False teachers are everywhere. And we as the church, it was happening here. And Peter is reminding us of that. And we need to follow someone who teaches the Word of God. Verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but by the holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And when they say holy men, it doesn't mean perfect men. Okay? Notice the word there, holy. It's not capitalized. Holy is God. These men pursued God, but they were just like you and I. And even in the canonization of Scripture, People will say, well, what about some of these guys? Man, they, you know, David and some of these things, they did some terrible things. But folks, they were convicted of that. And God spoke His Word to them. They wrote the Word down. They recorded it. And they wrote it down. Over centuries, they wrote these things down. And a, and a council got together and canonized that. And that's how we have the Holy Bible this day. Folks, it came from God. It was God speaking to these men and, and, and them writing things down as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So it's important that we understand the authority of Scripture. It is our absolute authority in our Christian life. Look at 2 Timothy 3. Just turn there real quick. Just two verses. 2 Timothy 3. Verse 16, 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture, okay? From Genesis to Revelation, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It came from God. Every Scripture that you see, every time you open up your Bible, it's God's holy Word. And it's profitable. Okay, we like profit. <laughs> we want to profit from things. It is profitable to the growing Christian. For what? For doctrine. What's doctrine? Folks, it's what we're studying. Our Baptist faith and message is doctrine. It's what we believe. It is for reproof. Reproof is what's not right. It's conviction. All right? For correction. It's how to get right. The Word of God will tell you how to get right with God. For instruction in righteousness. How to stay right with God and to live a righteous life. That's what the Word of God does. It instructs us, verse 17, that the man of God may be complete. And complete there means mature. Folks, if you don't read the Word of God, you're not growing in Christ. And if you're not growing in Christ, you are not maturing in Christ. And I've, I've said, and, and most people think, boy, if I just read my Bible once a day, that's good enough. Well, folks, Psalms tells you to meditate on it day and night. I start my day in the Word of God. I end my day in the Word of God. And I tell you, when I do both of those things, my day goes much better. And that's part of the, the maturing process of a Christian. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Everything you need to know about life is found in the Word of God. Every decision. These guys walk through valleys. These guys went through the storms of life. These guys penned, hey, 
Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you have to realize, to have a valley, you have to have two mountains. Folks, we can't always live on the mountaintops. God takes us through those valleys, and we can learn from the Psalms about valleys. And that's what the Word of God does in our lives. Now look at 1 Peter. Go to 1 Peter with me. We're talking about the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. 1 Peter 1, 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. What is he talking about? He's talking about salvation. Salvation. How does somebody get saved? First, they hear the Word of God. You hear the Word of God, and then you hear the Spirit of God. So the two things you have to do, you have to hear God's Word to be saved. You have to obey the Spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. Through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Peter's just saying a true reason that you know somebody's saved is they love folks. They just love the brethren. Okay? Folks, you you just can't hate. Hate cannot be a part of your dialogue. It cannot be a part of your life. You've got to get rid of all the hate and malice. It says love. Now look at verse 23. Having been born again, that means you're saved, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. Oh, listen to me, folks. That is so important about the Word of God. The Word of God is alive. It is alive. And it abides forever. Do you realize, even this day, if somebody took the Word of God from me, they can take my Bible, but they can't take the Word of God in me. Why? Because I have hidden the Word of God in my heart. I have memorized Scripture. And I'm telling you, if I was like Paul, or if I was like Peter and some of these folks that got arrested, and when there was only handwritten copies that only a few people had, I'm telling you, they would quote the Word of God while they were in prison. And it is alive. Hold your finger there and go to Hebrews with me. Just one verse. Hebrews. Go to Hebrews with me. 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living. It's alive. It's the only book that's alive and the author is in the room when you read it. God, the Holy Spirit, is with you. For the Word of God is alive. It's powerful. Powerful. Folks, the Word of God will change your life. It will change your life. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and content of the heart. You know what I love about the Word of God? When you memorize it, it will help you get away from sin. God created us as human beings that we can't think two thoughts at once. We can't. It is not possible for us to do that. And if we are thinking of the Word of God, and I've used this example, but I want to use it again. When David walked out on that balcony and he saw Bathsheba, if he would have just walked back in and started quoting some of the Psalms that he had written, or if he would quote even Romans chapter 6, what shall I say then? Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how am I who am dead to sin live any longer therein? And while you're quoting that scripture, that temptation of sin just goes away. Folks, that's what the Word of God does. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. We need the authority of God and in scripture in our lives. Now let's look to the rest. Back at 1 Peter, verse 24. 1 Peter 1.24, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. He said it twice. Why do you say it twice, folks? We say it for emphasis. I'm telling you, we're going through the seasons and then summer right now, and it's as green as any summer I've seen in Oklahoma or Arkansas. But I'm telling you, come fall, And in especially winter, the grass is going to die. The flower is going to die. You're going to die, my friend. But the Word of God lasts forever. Forever. You can't kill it. You can burn it, but you can't take it out of people's lives. The Word of God lasts forever. Now, this is the Word by which the Gospel was preached to you. 
Oh, listen to me, folks. We as a church need to teach the authority and the importance of God's holy word. Number two, we teach the preeminence of Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians with me. We teach the preeminence of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Folks, I'm telling you, an atheist, they could care less about the cross. An agnostic will not acknowledge the cross. The lost man will not acknowledge the cross. All these folks see it historically as an instrument of death. Of death. For the message of cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are, be, who are being saved, it is the power of God. Oh, listen to me, folks. The cross changed everything. The cross changed everything. Jesus Christ died on the cross. Jesus Christ gave his blood for you and I. But he did not stay in that tomb. Three days later, he arose. The cross changed everything. But to us who are being saved, do you realize being saved, past tense, I was saved from sin? God rescued me from sin. I am being saved. Today I'm being saved. It's a word we call sanctification. I'm growing in the Lord. I'm getting to know the Lord better. I have a personal relationship with Him. I read my Bible and I pray and I go to church. That's what sanctification. I am presently being saved. But you know the best part of salvation? It is future. I'm telling you one day we are going to get our glorified bodies and we're going to live with Christ forever and ever in a place called heaven. Can I get an amen today? We have been saved. We are being saved. We will be saved from sin forever and ever and ever. Verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring nothing to the understanding of the prudent. Folks, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is book knowledge. Folks, I went to school. I have two bachelor's degree. I have one in education and I have one in theology. And I'm telling you, folks, I, I learned and both are important, but my second one is so much more important than my first one. It is. Why? Because it was a Christian education. And not everybody can go to a Christian school. But folks, everybody can learn from the Word of God. Everyone can read from the Word of God. Everyone that is saved has the Holy Spirit helping them interpret that Scripture and understand that Scripture. Now look at, look at this. Paul is really getting on there. Where are the wise? Where is the scribe? Where's the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And you know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying, here's what it comes down to. Listen to what I'm saying. This is talking about God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom. The world's wisdom. Which, again, you can say philosophy. There's so many branches of what the world thinks is right. But I'm telling you folks, we as Christians have to follow God's wisdom. And then he gives us examples here. Look at verse 21. For since in, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased, it, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message priest to save those who believe. It started in Genesis, folks. He created man. And what did man? They couldn't leave things alone as it was. And they thought, well, let's get to heaven. What do we need to do? We need to build a tower. How dumb are these folks? All right? Build a tower to get to heaven. Folks, you don't have enough money. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough materials to do that. How dumb is the world? We'll get that way. What did God do? He just confused them. Then what did he say? You know what? Y'all are so full of sin. I'm just going to wipe you out. And, and he had the flood. And if you watch the pattern, you watch the pattern all through history, man has done that. Man has thought they were smarter than God. Man has thought they could figure things out. And I'm telling you, man's wisdom is foolishness to God. God's wisdom is amazing. God's wisdom is eternal. God's wisdom is everlasting. God's wisdom is holy. 
And folks, we need to be pursuing God's wisdom. This is what he's saying. Now look at this. For Jews, request a sign. What is he talking about? Remember in Jesus' days? Jesus, show us a sign. Man, heal somebody. Man, you know, calm that water. Just do this. And what you know what they got to doing? They were worshiping the miracle more than the man of the miracle, who was Jesus Christ himself. Show us. Well, I got news for you, folks. Jesus didn't do a lot of the miracles around them because they were, they were asking for the wrong motive. The Jews request a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. And again, when it says wisdom, knowledge, Greek theology, these Greek deep thinkers and all these things. Folks, I, I thank God for people that high, have high IQs. I thank God for people that have earned doctorates. You've earned that. I know what it takes to get an earned doctorate. And I'm just telling you, and again, not experientially, I've read the material, I've read to what it takes, and I'm thinking, you know what? My bachelor seems okay right now. All right. And maybe when I get old, all right, and I'm sitting around and having some time to think and more time to study, I might do something, you know, get a master's, and then I'm only saying there's nothing wrong with knowledge, but it is not as good as God's wisdom. It's not. But we preach Christ crucified. And folks, the hang-up with most of these folks was the cross. The Jews would not believe Jesus was the Messiah. What kind of Messiah would allow, uh, you know, the Romans to crucify them? All right? They, they, I mean, the, the, the cross was a stumbling block. But do you realize to the Christian and to us, the cross was God's plan of salvation? The cross. And we wear crosses on our necks, Ladies, the earrings, we have cross rings. And folks, it is more than an instrument of death. It is God's plan of salvation. And so many of them rejected the cross because they saw it as a sign of weakness. But I'm telling you, friend, it is a sign of strength. It takes a man, it takes a God-man to go to the cross and die for the whole world, folks. That's what the cross is. Verse 24, but those who are called, this is Christians, to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus told them all the time, if you've seen me, you've seen God. And that just made them so mad. But I'm telling you, Jesus had the wisdom of God. Jesus knew what they were thinking before they even said it. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Folks, we're talking about the preeminence of, preeminence of God. He, Jesus Christ is the one and only. There's no one greater. There's no one smarter. There's no one more important than your, in your life than Jesus Christ. Colossians 1, look at this. Colossians 1, go with me. Colossians 1, verse 16. For by Him, and that would be Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven that are on earth. Jesus was in creation. Read John chapter 1, verse 1. St. John 1, 1. Invisible. Visible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were re- created through Him and for Him. Folks, I'm telling you, God was not created. He was always been. Jesus was not created. He came to earth. All right, but he was already in heaven with God. He is eternal. He is forever, forever lasting. And look what it says. All things were created through him and for him. That's in him. Jesus Christ for him and through him. Jesus Christ was in creation. Verse 17. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. Oh, folks, to a Christian. To our doctrine, folks, Jesus is everything. The preeminence. He is the center of our doctrine. He is the one who saves us. He is the one that we need to follow as an example. Jesus needs to be preeminent in our life. And here it is. Look at verse 18. And He is the head of the body. Folks, I'm telling you, no one in all of churches, in all the churches of all denominations, of all history is more important than Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead, folks, but he died later on. Jesus rose from the dead and is still living in heaven today that in all things he may have the preeminence. What is the preeminence? It's the center of every doctrine that we are. It is everything that we believe. Everything is in Jesus Christ. John 14.6 John 14.6 Remember what Jesus said. He did not say, I am a way. But there's only one way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ the Lord. You're being exclusive. No, I'm telling you. God gave you a choice. You don't have to believe it. But this word says, I am the way, the truth, the only truth, and the life. You want everlasting life, you better come the way Jesus says. Jesus says, come to me, all of you that are heavy laden. He's telling us that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen to this. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Folks, that is preeminence. Jesus Christ is the most important person ever, ever. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I'm telling you that is your greatest need. The need for salvation. The need for the forgiveness of sin. The need for everlasting life. The third thing. We teach the authority of Scripture. We teach the preeminence of Christ. And we teach the importance of wisdom. The importance of wisdom. Look at Proverbs with me. Proverbs. Folks, we've got to get where we're reading the Word of God. One thing I like to do every once in a while, we're fixing to come up to August 1st. August 1st. And I'm telling you, some of you would do well in your Christian growth if you would read on August 1st, Psalms 1 and Proverbs 1. And as you go through the month of August, read Psalms 2 and then Proverbs 2. I'm telling you, there's comfort, there's wisdom there, and Proverbs is the wisdom book. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. Get wisdom! Exclamation point! We all need wisdom. What is wisdom? My definition is knowing the mind of God and doing it. You can know the mind of God. You can read the Bible, but if you don't obey it, you are not wise. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn, or, turn away uh, from the words of my mouth. When you read the Bible, it's as God is speaking to you. I'm telling you, if certain people would come to our town, people of wisdom, people of prominence, the president or things like that. I mean, it, we'd go somewhere and we'd stand outside in a 100 degree temperature to hear from somebody like that. But yet we have Bibles sitting in our homes and we will not open them up and hear from the Word of God. It's God's words. That's what this says. My words from my mouth is what it says. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her. Love the Word of God. Love wisdom, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. It's most important. That's what Proverbs says. Wisdom is the most important thing after salvation. It is the principal. Therefore, get wisdom twice. He tells you to get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her. She will promote you. See, we, we, we think promotions at work and there's nothing wrong with promotions at work. But I'm telling you, if you will please God in your personal life, it will happen. He will bless you. He will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace. We all need grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. A crown of glory she will deliver to you. All this is getting wisdom. Hear my son and receive my sayings. And the years of your life will be many. You want to live longer? Be wise. Be wise. I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will be not hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Listen to the promises from God. Folks, we're missing it. Some folks need to turn off that stinking TV. I know, I, I watch it. I watch baseball games and things. But folks, not before I read my Bible. Not before I spend time in prayer. 
If you're too busy to read your Bible, you're too busy. You need to change something. And when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction and do not let go. Keep her, for she is your life. The last Scripture, Proverbs 2. Proverbs 2, verse 6. For the Lord gives wisdom. You want wisdom? You spend time with the Lord, folks. You spend time with the Lord. From His mouth comes knowledge and understand it. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He stores it. He reminds you of Scripture. And folks, I like to do more than just memorize the Scripture. You need to memorize the reference. And when I'm writing, and I'm telling you, every Monday morning I sit down with my Bible in hand, a blank piece of paper in my hand, and I say, okay, Lord, where are we going today? And I have a topic, but He gives me the Scripture. And I'm telling you, I want to just go to the Scripture. I want to be able to, to, in my head, just go to the Scripture that I'm thinking at. And then have the reference there. And there's some times I have to look it up, okay? I have to look it up in a concordance or in a, a, a topical Bible. But most of the time, I'm telling you, we need to be able to give the reference to what we are reading. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice. He preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. Folks, I am telling you, if we will make this our textbook, if we will go to school, go to Christian school every day, right in your home, your devotion, your quiet time, your prayer time, that is so important for Christian education. I thank God for our Sunday school teachers. I thank God for our Bible studies. All these things, folks, help us in Christian education. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. We need to know thus Faith the Lord. We need to be able to lead people to, to, to the Lord and to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to know the Romans road. And that's what he's saying. Folks, it's so important. Not just as Baptists, but as, as Christians to have a Christian education. And folks, I'm telling you, with the Word of God, we can go to school every day. Wisdom comes from God. Let me close with this statement. It is the church's responsibility to help teach the Word of God to families and to undergird the task of evangelism, missions, and discipleship in the church. I'll say it again. It is the church's responsibility to help teach the Word of God to families, to undergird the task of evangelism, missions, and discipleship in the church. Father, I thank You for this day. and God, I thank You for Your Holy Word. God, I just thank You, Lord, just uh, just for what You do, God. You, you are just amazing. I, I just thank You for a Christian education. Lord, I thank You for the authority of Scripture. God, I thank You for the preeminence of Christ. And God, I thank You for wisdom. God, I want wisdom in my life. And God, I pray that each of us would pursue wisdom wisdom. God, we've got to open up the book. We've got to have the, the Bible as our textbook. We've got to spend time in the Word, our own prayer closets, memorizing Scripture, meditating on Scripture. And God, I pray that we would all do better in this area. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, just one, that today would be their day of salvation. God, it is the greatest gift. It is the greatest decision a person could ever make. So God, I pray your Holy Spirit would convict hearts. If anybody's here and needs you, God, I pray that they would come. And God, I pray for maybe some rededications. Maybe maybe just people aren't spending enough time in the Word. People are, are just so busy, God. I pray that we could just refocus, reboot, re refocus on what we need to do as Christians. Maybe some need to come uh, Lord, to follow you in baptism or even join the church. God, they've been thinking about it and today the Holy Spirit is telling them. God, I pray that they would just follow through with what they, what you tell them to do. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. This is your time. So God, we give it all to you. We love you. 
We thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. God, I pray that we would pursue it with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?